Welcome to the Porch. I'm Richard Grund. This is where we get back to basics, the red letter basics. We examine the Word of God as it was written, as it was given to us. We figure out what it says according to the Hebrew, the Greek, and all the various things that tell us so that we can find the church that the Lord intended, not the one that man created, not the one weighted down with traditions and and all the other things that have kept the world from knowing the truth. We dig deeper into Scripture. We have always been about restoring the priesthood of the believer and regaining the world-shaking influence that the early Book of Acts church had. The church age is still in effect. The day of Pentecost is ongoing. It hasn't stopped the fire that hit the upper room and hit the early church still falls. If that's why you're here, you're in the right place. If you're looking for tradition, if you're looking to have your ears tickled, if you're looking for religion, I'm sorry this isn't the place. But if you want to know how to walk the walk, talk the talk, set the captives free, and do what the Lord and the disciples and the early church did, get ready. If you have any questions, go to firefalltalkradio.com, use the contact button, or you can write us directly at the porch at firefalltalkradio.com. If you want to support us, there are ways to do that. Go to firefalltalkradio.com, bottom of the home page. We appreciate you, each and every one of you that do support us. Just pray about it and give us the Lord leads. If you want to encourage us, that that's great. If you want to pray or you need prayer, let us know. Welcome to all of our listeners from the various streaming platforms. Somebody reached out to me this week, Nick in Dallas. Thank you, Nick. He wanted to know if what was going on with my voice, was there something happening or was it seasonal allergies? Well, if you've been with me over the long haul, you know that allergies and sinus problems are a regular part of my life. And right now we're in deep into the thick of it. So Sometimes it's gravelly, sometimes it's clear, sometimes I feel like a nut, sometimes I don't. Um, But thank you, Nick, for asking. I really do appreciate you doing that. So let's get started. Father, I'm just so excited to talk about you and about your word, to be with your children, even over its long distance and electronics. We just love you. You are an awesome Abba, Papa, Daddy, we praise you. We thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. We thank you for sending Yeshua to do what we could never do. We could never pay the debt. We could never do anything that needed to be done to be reconciled to you. So thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for giving us everything you have, whether it's our homes or our spouses, you know, for me, it's my wife and my family, sons, daughter-in-law, grandson, furry kids. Everything we have comes from you, your provision, your protection, your your fulfillment of prophecy, the dreams and the visions, the healing virtues, allowing us to pray in your name, giving us revelation, sending the Holy Spirit to walk with us and teach us and to turn us into new creations. Now, Lord, we come before you and we pray. We pray first for Jerusalem, the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you, as you say in Psalm 122, verse 6. We pray for America. Lord, we know that there are things that are wrong and there are things that are right, but we are your people and we're asking you to intervene and to bless us. Correct us. Fix what needs to be fixed, no matter how you need to do it. We pray for all your children that are being persecuted and martyred and and all the horrendous things that Hasatan and the fallen and their demonic offspring are doing to your creation. Please, Lord, please empower us to go and, and do something about it. But until then, we pray for the fatherless and the widows, the persecuted and the martyred the poor in spirit, the bound, the oppressed, and those that are victims of injustice. We pray for the innocents both in and out of the womb. We pray against the slaughter of the innocent. We pray pray against 
what Satan is doing with human trafficking and sex trafficking and all the horrible, horrible things he's still allowed to do. Right now, Lord, I pray for your children and for myself for divine wholeness, health, and healing. Let us get back to your divine design. The Holy Spirit, wake up the remnant. Wake up the children. Wake up your church so that we can do what needs to be done, that we can prepare the way, make straight the highway, set the captives free, heal the sick, raise the dead. Bless us, Lord, with what we need to do these things, both heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit, physically, spiritually, financially, whatever it is, you are our provider. Jehovah Jireh. So we believe and we receive right now all that you have for us. We pray our family members into the kingdom. As I pray right now, brothers and sisters, you think about and take before the Lord any family member, friend, somebody that you've been praying for their salvation, and let's call them into the kingdom. Oh, boy. Father, in the name of Yeshua, send your angel, send your spirit whether dreams, visitations, or somebody showing up and knocking on their door to tell them how much you love them, to break through the darkness, break through all the things that have kept them from you. We claim them. We call them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Their name's written in the Lamb's book of life. And we praise you for it right now. We praise you for this time. We praise you for the technology. And we thank you for the ability to do this. If you agree with me, just say amen. These lessons are proprietary information, except where noted the information comes from outside sources. The combination of that information, the matter presented, is exclusive, cannot be repeated or used without permission. The date of this broadcast serves as the registered date of the following information. Well, I hope you can hear it. I'm excited already. I'm not sure what happened just before I had to sit down and lock in to get ready to do all this stuff. This this joy, this excitement just hit me in the... And the message is going to be a little difficult, a little harder than it's been. But some, something happened, something shifted, and I believe it's because if you're listening, if you're here with me, whether live or archived, recorded, however you listen, wherever you're listening, you're hungry for something more. I know I am. We're talking about behaving like a believer in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, not some religious figure, not some plaster of Paris statue or image on the wall, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who rose from the dead, the one who will come back to judge them all and put everything back in place. And I think what hit me, and I, and I wrote it down, why I was so excited for you, is that the world needs you. The church needs you to show them what tradition and religion hasn't. Everything flows from relationship with him. It's all about him. It's not about a pastor or a preacher or a teacher. It's not about people who put their names on their ministries. It's about him. And him alone, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, Son of the living God. And this foundation that he built upon, that he's the chief cornerstone of, is love. Love for him, love from him, and having his love for others. Love and compassion that just keeps coming back. And I'm not talking about secular love, a human love, or any of those. No, I'm talking about the key ingredients to the life of a believer. The ingredients of ministry and evangelism and even spiritual warfare is love and compassion. It requires it. 
It's the fuel that runs it, and without it, you will fail. 1 John 4.20, if anyone says, I love God and hates, detests, abhors his brother or sister and Messiah, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. If we cannot love, we cannot serve him. This is something I've had to learn along the way. This wasn't uh, an automatic for me. It actually took me being softened some time ago, going through an event, going through some things that really rocked me and shook me and got me to the place that I had to be softened. I had to be taken through the grindstone, if you will. Sometimes he has to do that. So it's a matter of love. It's a matter of the heart. And we've been basing these times together on Romans 12, verses 9 through 13. If your Bible's not open by now, then you must be new to the porch. Something should be open. Your mind, first of all. Uh, the Bible, whether physical or digital. And I'm going to say this again. If you're not paying attention to the news, you better have a physical Bible. You better have one. Because you may not be able to get online. You may not be able to plug into anything. The Word should already be inside you, but you need a tangible Bible. If you don't have one, if by some bizarre reason you can't afford one, you write to us and we'll figure it out. Let your love be sincere, a real thing. Hate what is evil. Loathe all ungodliness. I'm sorry, I got stuck on that word. All ungodliness turn in horror from wickedness, but hold fast to that which is good. Love one another with brotherly love as members of one family, giving precedence and showing honor to one another. Never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor, be aglow, burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoice and exult in hope, be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people, sharing in the necessities of the saints. Pursue the practice of hospitality. We've been jumping around, I've been hitting key words, but verse 9 is kind of where we're going to be tonight. Let your love be sincere, a real thing, which we've covered. Hate what is evil, loathe all ungodliness, turn in horror from wickedness, but hold fast to that which is good. And it's that part to hate what is evil and hold fast to which is good, that we're going to talk about. It's not going to be a comfortable conversation. At times, it may not be a pretty conversation, but it's one we need to have. Every Friday night, we do Shabbat. We've been doing it for a long time. And we read scriptures, and we give testimonies, praise reports, prayer requests. And this scripture popped up in my app as I was looking for something. And I wanted to save it. It's Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. It says, Love fulfills God's requirements. Owe nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say, You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up In this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of the law. That does not say that those commandments are no longer in effect. What it says is if you love people the way we are told to love, you won't do those other things. You won't murder. You won't steal. You won't covet. You won't commit adultery. See, the law was given as a guideline and a way to avert wrong behavior and choices and to keep us in right relationship with God. Now, we know that it is impossible in our flesh to do so. But they're still there. Those rules are still there. And I see people all the time, especially when I post stuff that refers to this, well, I'm not under the law. The law is no longer in effect. I said, no, no, no. You, you need to go back and see what Paul said. 
the law was a pattern and an example to show us until Messiah came. But those rules are still in effect for the world, and essentially they're still there for us. So go with me to Exodus chapter 20 really quickly. And let's take a look at what we call the Ten Commandments and why God put them there. Because they will form a a foundation or a, a fabric to how to behave properly. And I like the, the heading says Ten Commandments for the Covenant Community. That's us. It was Israel. Israel was the first covenant community. But we've been grafted into that vine, and even more so, we've been given the Holy Spirit inside of us. The Ruach HaKadosh, the spirit that raised him from the grave, is in you and I. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. I lay the sins of the parent upon the children, and the entire family is affected, even children into the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generation on generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day. Dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. That includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male servant, female servant, your your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all is in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That's why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He set it apart as holy. Now we get into some do's and don'ts. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land your Lord God is giving you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not cover, covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, You you speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you, and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. As the people stood in the distance, Moses approached the dark cloud where God was. God wants to speak directly to us, but he gives us direction and warnings so that we won't sin. He tells us, don't do this, or you can do that. Don't sin. Nobody wants to talk about sin. Nobody wants to talk about do's and don'ts. They want to talk about grace, oh, forgiveness, and everything's built upon rules. God's kingdom is a kingdom of order and decency. It's a kingdom of rules. It's a kingdom of commandments. Deuteronomy 11, starting verse 22, For if you carefully keep all the command, these commandments which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to hold fast to him. Then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you, and you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourselves. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours, 
from the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon the, all the land where you tread, just as he has said to you. If you will keep these commandments, are they really that hard to do? What is it that we don't like to be told what to do? Have you ever seen children when they hit that rebellious stage? They don't want to be told what to do. But within this are blessings and curses. If you jump down to verse 26 of Deuteronomy 11. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. Now, when you look at that scripture, and I just read it out loud, and I heard it for myself, it makes sense why Asadon and the Fallen would want to trick people into worshiping other gods. Because it triggers an automatic curse in their lives. And they definitely don't come to bring good things. So the opposite of a blessing is a curse. There's no middle ground. Well, it's a partial blessing and a partial... No, no, no. It's either a blessing or it's a curse. And God's blessings, your Abba's blessings, bring vitality. But his curse takes that all away. The Nelson Study Bible, New King James Version, explains what this was all about. And I could just simply put the word church in for Israel, but I'll leave it the way the Study Bible wrote it. Israel was on the verge of a monumentous occasion. Not only were they preparing to enter the promised land and conquer its inhabitants, they were also preparing to establish a brand new culture. The primary focus of this new culture would be the living God. Every part of it would reflect his nature. God's commandments gave the Israelites a concrete expression of how God wanted the people to live. In short, he wanted a people that loved and worshipped him alone. By keeping a number of purity laws, the Israelites were to demonstrate their commitment to him by keeping ritually clean. Ideally, this outward purity would reflect an inward purity. Since God was perfect, he wanted his people to resist the immoral practices of the neighboring nations. But he not only wanted them to resist evil, he wanted them to reflect his loving and compassionate nature by helping strangers, widows, orphans, and the poor. By following God's extensive instructions, the Israelites could establish their society on the just laws of the living God. Oh my goodness, when I read that, I thought, just think if the church would do this. Just think if we would walk what we talk and do what he said. Just think if we reflected his love and comp loving, compassionate nature to this fallen world. And some people do. They help the strangers and the widows and the orphans and the poor. But for, for many, it's just an outward expression. It's not an inward feeling. But the part that becomes uncomfortable, and, and I'm just going to be honest here as I always am, the part that becomes uncomfortable is this, this love I'm explaining to you is both spontaneous and conditional. Now, we, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that the relationship has conditions to it. But every relationship has conditions to it. I mean, his love is not motivated by any intrinsic merit in the object of his love, but the blessings of God's love is contingent upon in this case, Israel's obedience to the legal stipulations of the divine covenant given to them, but it's even contingent upon our relationship with his son. 
And I know so many people who claim to be believers that don't want to hear that. A loving God would not condemn people to hell. But he doesn't. He simply gives them the choice that they've made. But he has set apart for us parameters and guidelines that if you do this, you get that. If you don't do this, then you get this. Why is that so hard? Why don't we want to hear that, not just as a people, but as the church? Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Jumping down to verse 13 of Deuteronomy 7. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. Now we know he's talking to Israel, but we've been grafted into the vine. And if everywhere we go, we did this. Do you understand now why the enemy wants to destroy the world? He wants to destroy the land. He wants to take away your ability to multiply, to to feed yourself. He wants the enemy wants you indebted to him so that you are not in covenant relationship with God. Well, I'll just say it real clear. I don't care what the enemy wants. God's love is exclusive. And it's the only appropriate response to what he's done for us, what he's willing to do for us, and this covenant that he gave us, especially the one sealed in the blood of the Lamb. And it requires absolute loyalty. One of my pet peeves, and you know it because I talk about it a lot, is if I'm on social media and I see somebody who claims to be a believer and they are posting quotes from, first of all, other religions, quotes from false teachers, quotes from secular humanistic books or worse, New Age books, and acting as if that knowledge came from God, or telling you things that have no basis in the Word or in the nature of the living God. And I want to scream at them, but I, I know I can't. And I pray for them, but I realize they don't really know him. Because when you know him, when you love him the way I'm talking about, it's absolute. It's totally loyal. And you will not commit spiritual adultery with any other God, any other teaching, any other thought pattern. If you really know what he did for you on the cross, why? Why would you whore yourself like Israel did over and over and over with the lying, false teachings and and everything the enemy's still doing thousands of years later? But he shows mercy to thousands to love him and keep his commandments says it in Exodus 20. He says it in Deuteronomy 5. He says it in Deuteronomy 7. It's the constant refrain. I love you and I show you mercy. And all I ask that you do is love me in return and keep my commandments. Relationship has its privileges, no doubt about it. But we demean him and his blessings when we water down the requirements to have them. But yet we do it in the world. You want to join a club, you got to adhere to the rules. you got to sign an agreement. There's so many things in marriage. There's so many things that we say, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that, and I'll abide by these requirements. But then when it comes to God and the Bible or this relationship, oh, no, no, you're just supposed to love me as I am. Well, he does love you as you are. And as I was taught way back 33 plus years ago, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. His ultimate goal is to bring you to the best that you can be. 
So the desired human response to God's love and the command to love in return should come from your whole being. Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, isn't it interesting? I'm talking about not sinning. I'm talking about uh, abhorring and avoiding and turning away from evil, but it's based upon what? Love. If you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, this won't be a problem. It's when the other affections of the world and other things and your own desires seep in there. Psalm 31, verses 23 and 24. Oh, love the Lord your God, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and he fully repays the proud person. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for and hope for and expect the Lord. This suggests that the love relationship between God and his people is as much an act of the will as it is an emotion of the heart. Choose. Choose to love. So, oh boy, I wish we were in a, a room where we could discuss or we had a better way to do this, but this is what we have. I want, I'm going to ask, I'm going to say something, and I want you to think about it, and I want you to make notes for yourself. Hopefully you're doing that. Hopefully you're taking notes. Hopefully you're thinking about what is said. Some of you tell me you download it, and you listen it again, and you go over things, and, and that's great, and that's why I do all this. But when you think about God's love for you, how do you feel? Do you feel it? Do you believe it? Does it inspire you to be a better person? Does it inspire you to treat people better? If it doesn't, there's no condemnation, but you have to figure out why. Is it false teaching? Is it bad programming? Are you still carrying the wounds of your youth or your adulthood? Somebody did something to you, so you're afraid to love? Fear of rejection, fear of failure. You see, God's love is who he is. It's his nature. And it's rooted in his righteousness. It's not just sentimental. Psalm 11, verse 7, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. And the, his love is a result in a relationship. In a fellowship with the faithful. Psalm 33, verse 5, he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Oh, wait a second, Richard, don't you, don't you watch the news? Don't you, don't you get online? The earth's not full of the goodness of the Lord. No, the, the legacy media that's controlled by the enemy focuses on the things that are not of God, not the things of God. If you had a TV show or a news show or a network that only gave good news, you know what would happen? And it's been proven. It would go under. You wouldn't be sell at, you wouldn't be able to sell advertising revenue because that's not what people want to see. Our base human nature is we don't want that. We think we do, but we become born again and we become more like him and we seek it out. But the truth is what pro, what proliferates streaming television, crime shows, murder, mayhem, it's just something about who we are, and Satan has taken it a, a advantage of it. The Lord loves justice, and he does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Psalm 37, verse 28. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Psalm 45, verse 7. Can we hate wickedness without hating the people that do it? There, there's the conflict. Can you hate the sin, but not the sinner? And you know, the world has heard that enough. Now it hates that phrase, too. 
doesn't want to hear it. But I'll say it. I can love the person, but I can hate the sin because of what that sin does to them, what that sin does in their life, how it happened to them, and what, what they do with it. That's why we have to show others how to live the life that we talk about here on the porch. It's a life of power. It's a life of compassion. It's a life of love that changes things. That's how the leper got healed. It was love and compassion. That's how he raised the dead, love and compassion. How the disciples did what they did, how the Book of Acts Church did what they did, it was love and compassion, and it was they drew a line in the sand, and they said, I'm going to believe this, and I'm going to speak this, and I don't care what you have to say, world leader. You're not going to shut me up. The school district in Texas today, or I think yesterday or Monday, sent out an order for like 50 books to be removed from all libraries. One of them was the Bible. Somebody complained about it. Another was the story of Anne Frank. No, nobody wants to hear about that. They don't want to hear about the truth. They don't want to hear about the ugliness of the world. They don't want to hear about the answer to the ugliness of the world. We have to hold our ground. And we've got to show them this. See, God's true people love his law. I didn't always understand this, and this is new for me. What I'm about to say to you is something I've learned over maybe the last decade or so, or not learned as much as understood. But the true people of God love his law, and I'll explain why. Psalm 119, verse 47, I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. Verse 48, my hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Psalm 119, verse 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And I've had people that love the law more than they love God and definitely think that they live out the law, but they don't. Quote these scriptures, but miss the meaning. Why would David say this? Why would the psalmist say this? Why would the people say this? Why would they love his law? Because it comes from a position of compassion and love and a desire for their best. You don't give your children guidelines because you want to hurt them. You give them guidelines or rules to protect them. Oh, but Richard Jesus didn't do this. He didn't say anything about this stuff. Oh, yeah, he did. You really need to go back and read the Bible. If you love me, you'll do what I say. That's basically John 14, starting in verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine but the Father's who sent me. If you love me, you'll do what I say. But right after he gives us this admonition, he shows us how we're going to be able to do it. John 14, verse 25. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Don't let it be troubled about what I just said. Don't be afraid. You're going to be able to do this because I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. What he tells us right there in John 14 is obedience is a byproduct of relationship with him. And knowing that in our human nature we can't do it, he sends the Holy Spirit to walk it out with us, to assist us. Are you getting why the presence and the infilling of the Holy Spirit is so vital? 
So to love, we must avert, avoid hate. To obey, we must avoid disobedience. Boy, that's pretty simple, right? Pretty basic. Satan's kingdom is the polar opposite of God's kingdom. It is a complete counterfeit. It is a complete mirror image, but reversed. Satan offers darkness for God's light. Satan offers hate for God's love. And Satan offers bondage for God's freedom. And I can't believe how many people line up for what Satan offers. Oh, I can't I can't do this love thing. I can't do this this Jesus Yeshua thing. I I'm, I'm born again. Don't say that term to me. I was dunked, sprinkled, slapped. I've kneeled, I've I've done this, I've done that. I don't need to do all that stuff. And then they line up like lambs to the slaughter. This remarkable covenant of love that he's given us causes God to save the righteous and in doing so sing over them with gladness. Zephaniah 3.17 The Lord your God is in the midst of you, a mighty one, a Savior who saves. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in silent satisfaction and in his love he will be silent and make no mention of the past sins or even recall them. He will exalt over you with singing. Satan does just the opposite. He condemns you. He reminds you of your past. And God, no, no, the Lord doesn't do that. He sings. He exalts. It's under the blood. It's been forgiven. It's not in the, in the book anymore, the book of life. It's blotted out by the blood. The kingdom of darkness doesn't want you to experience that love. The world which serves the kingdom of darkness doesn't want you to experience that love because that love sets the captives free. That love inspires you to share the gospel and lay hands and to pray for people and just risk it all, come out of your comfort zone to do whatever needs to be done to show them God's love. No, no, no. Satan doesn't want you to have it, doesn't want you to share it, doesn't want you to tell anybody about it. That's why he inspires disobedience, to keep you from it. That's why he tricks us into sinning or doing what requires God to respond to because he is a holy God. He is a righteous God. If he has set apart these rules, set aside these rules, he has to do them. He can't say, well, if you do this, I'm going to do that and then not follow through. That's just not in his nature. Which is why in the scripture it says, turn away. Turn in horror from wickedness. Avert. That means to avoid, to keep from happening, to prevent. So first, let your love be sincere. Let it be a real thing. Hate what is evil. Loathe all ungodliness and turn in horror from wickedness, but hold fast to that which is good. He's saying, that don't just turn away, but do it in horror. Be repulsed by it. Okay, so here's where I get to step on some toes a little bit, and I didn't set out to do that, but when I typed out this thought that the Lord gave me, I realized for some it may be a little harsh. The church, his body, is too casual about sin and the workings of the enemy. We want to be seeker-friendly, but we don't want to convict anybody. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We want to draw everybody in, but we don't want to change their lives. We don't want to tend to their wounds. We don't want to explain to them, hey, this is how you got this wound. Maybe you might not want to do that again. Another variation to abhor that which is evil is to hate, to detest, and to loathe all evil. Abhorring the Bible means to turn oneself away from something as if it were a repulsive, detestable stench. Sin, when you can smell it, or if you're in the presence of a demonic spirit, 
it it's it's bad. It's like rotten eggs. In my book, The Supernatural Battle, I call it the perfume Eau de Pit because it smells like the pit. Sulfurous. There's nothing good about it. We see it in the world. We see people bound in bondage and sin and whose lives have been destroyed and they've lost the ability to function and fit into this world. And there's a stench that goes with it. I lived in New York. I rode the subways late at night. I went to high school down in lower Manhattan. I I saw a lot of this. Never understood what it was. I saw people in a bondage that inside that bondage, inside that rotting clothes and flesh and whatever was a person, a hurting, lost person. I didn't know what he needed then. I do now. Romans 21.8 takes that word and makes it to be abominable. Romans 21.8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, why would he do that? Because anything that I just mentioned is not of God has nothing of him in it, and is primarily inspired by Satan and the fallen in the kingdom of darkness. But why don't we want to talk about this? Well, it's uncomfortable, Richard. It's not fun. It's not pretty. Well, if you you get in a ministry, things are not going to be pretty. They're not going to be always comfortable. Well, I'm not in ministry. Yeah, you are. Every day of your life, if you're going to go make disciples of all men, if you're going to tell them about the Lord, you're in ministry. You're an evangelist from the moment you wake up to the time you go to sleep, whether by word or action. In the Dictionary of Bible Themes, the word evil means the presence of corruption, malevolence, and depravity in the world. Opposed to God's nature and will. Scripture stresses that evil is a force in its own right than the mere absence of good. Describes its origins and the manner in which God deals with its continuing presence and power in the world. In his world. Well, we know where evil comes from. We know who the evil one is. We know what the outcome of evil and what he's doing. We see it. We know what the Word says. But will we ever do anything about it? That's the question. And I I don't mean doing what I do with SRT and confronting things and, and, and all. That's not what I mean. Will we ever walk a walk that is so righteous and so committed to our Abba Father that there is no room for this in our lives? There's no tolerance for it in our families and in our bodies, which we call church, the fellowships. Nobody wants to offend anybody. Nobody wants to challenge anybody. Nobody wants to call it out for what it is. Because if you do, the crowds leave, the offering goes down, and then they can't pay the rent or the insurance or whatever on the giant monstrosity they just built. No, we've been called to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. That's Proverbs 4, 23 through 27. This word sin is simply anything that's against God. It's evil actions from a spiritual perspective. Not just against humanity or society or others or ourselves. It's ultimately against God. 
It has one source and one source alone. See, for me, doing this study and, and all the work and seeing the scriptures and tying it all together, I understand now why they loved, or you should love, his law. Because it keeps you safe. It keeps you protected. It keeps the enemy from you. It's the standard for human behavior. Sin is missing the mark or failing in our duty. Romans 3.23, for all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So as a lawgiver, he has set limits to our freedom. So if you overstep those limits, you're in transgression, you're in rebellion, you've been trespassing upon his grace, you've, you've incurred a response to that, you've stepped out of his appointed way, and you've wandered into forbidden ground. That's not that hard to understand. But when you meditate on his word and you understand that his love inspires him to warn us not to do the things which put us in the enemy's camp. So we're called to love the things of God and the people of God and love those who need God. But we can't do that if we love the world or the things in the world. So he says, don't do that. Don't love the things of the world or the things in the world. Because all those things are passing away, but he is forever. And if you love the world or the things in the world, then what you've done is the uh, your eyes, your flesh, the devil, everything's taken over your gaze, your focus. Which leads us to how that scripture ends. It leaves us only one choice. Cleave to that which is good. Cling to that which is good. Be cemented and glued to the good. Because if you do good, you're acting in a way designed to benefit others, which is what? Where we started, a characteristic of God. He inspires, requires, and enables us to do good, even though it's contrary to the basic human sinful nature. Salvation doesn't come from good works, but once obtained, it leads to them. This is really pretty simple. It's pretty basic. Romans 13, starting verse 12. And, and please, please, I know I say this, and you should have been listening to me already. But if your your mind's wandered off to your smartphone or your emails or somebody sent you a text, stop just for a second. The night is far spent. You see that, right? The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on, Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, put on the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Don't do anything that puts you in the enemy's camp. Don't do anything that gives the the, the enemy ground in your life. The war between light and darkness is already won. It happened on Calvary. We've been empowered when he rose from the dead and sent back the Holy Spirit and gave it to us to continue that victory. So let's, let's behave in such a way that shows that. Let's behave in such a way that we can help others to see it. Remember I said in the beginning, the world needs you because through us, he can turn them away from destruction and towards the freedom of salvation. He is their only hope, and we're the ones to show them. Oh, Father, we love you. And maybe in our human minds, our finite minds, we really don't understand how much you love us. But we won't try. Holy Spirit, help us. Heal those wounds. Heal the rejection. Heal the words. Heal the, all the things that the enemy has done through others. 
parents, spouses, friends, loved ones, even strangers. And Lord, as I pray, I speak to that spirit of rejection, which I know so well and actually caused me to do a lot of the things I did. The Lord loves you with a di- an undying love. But Yeshua loved you so much that he died for you. You've never been rejected. It was all a lie. Be healed in the name of Yeshua. Father, help us. Help us to be what you need us to be in this time. Help us to be the shining light to glory. Help us to lead people home. Set the cap free. Walk in liberty. Behave like a believer. In Yeshua, King of kings, Lord of lords. Help us to inspire others to find this freedom, to find this hope, to understand your word and to love it and to meditate upon it and to want to hear it. Lord, I know for me, I get excited about it because your words are life. Everything you've given us is empowered by the creative power of the universe inside of us, the spirit that raised you from the dead. And we're more than conquerors through you because who you love us. Help us to shine. Help us to glow in the spirit. Help us to be what you need us to be. I pray these things, Lord, from my heart with every bit of love and passion I have for you and in Yeshua's name. And if you agree with me, just say amen. You have these to download. You have these to listen to. In, on all the streaming places, all the shows from, I think, 2015 and on, maybe more have been stored. But we're getting to the point in the accumulation of uh, Bible studies and other things we've done where the older ones are going to start being dropped off, deleted. So if you're really interested, just go through the list. Go through the archives. Find the various ones. Listen to some of the reflections in the darks, whatever, because the older ones are going to be gone pretty soon. And I pray for you. I really do each and every day. I pray. So let me bless you. Actually, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Give you shalom. I'm Richard Grund. This has been The Porch on Firefall Talk Radio.